Good afternoon and welcome to our TV show featuring documentaries revealing the realities behind myths using research and scholarship. I'm your host, Ergun Kurlikovalu, and I will be with you every Sunday at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You're welcome to send me your feedback at mythsandrealities.com. When the First World War ended, the American Protestant missionaries in the Ottoman Empire got together behind a massive drive to influence American policy towards an American mandate over Anatolia. This would be like what Britain and France did in, in Arab lands. Missionaries argued that failing to do so would result in anarchy in Anatolia, causing many Christians to be killed, even the entire lot exterminated. Source, Justin McCarthy, The Turk in America, Creation of an Enduring Preju Prejudice, published by the University of Utah Press, Salt Lake City, 2010, page 20 271. 75 bishops in American churches, primarily Methodist and Episcopalian, asked President Wilson in 1919 to accept an American mandate over Armenia. Source, U.S. National Archives, 867B.00-62. The American Committee for Independence of Armenia soon turned into a lobbying group for American mandate over Armenia. There were 12 members in it from the Near East Relief, including its chair, James Barton. The group was led by another Near East Relief member and ambassador, James W. Gerard. Source, the Joint Mandate Scheme, a Turkish Empire under American Protection, ACIA Report, New York, 1919. Another major lobbying group, the, the Armenian American Society, was founded by the former American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief representative Walter George Smith and led by Smith and George R. Montgomery, another missionary. Source, Thomas A. Bryson. The Armenian American Society, a factor in American-Turkish relations, 1919 to 1924. Records of the American Catholic Historical Society of Philadelphia, 82, number 2, 1971, pages 83 to 105. Barton led the campaign for an American mandate by making public numerous speeches, giving press interviews, and promoting the theme everywhere that only under an American mandate could Armenia could expect unity, independence, and safety from annihilation. Source? Urges American Mandate, The New York Times, November 2nd, 1919, page 5. Also mandatory in the Near East advocated. Christian Science Monitor, December 8th, 1919, page 4. Barton was telling Americans, without naming sources as usual, that the Turkish nationalists were planning extermination of the Armenians in Cilicia and elsewhere, as soon as the Allies left, source, Turks declare plans to slay Armenians, New York Times, February 15, 1920, page 5. This was a total misrepresentation, of course, as the leader, leaders of the Turkish nationalists, especially Atatürk, made it clear in his meeting with General Harbour in 1919, and then again in his address to the Turkish parliament, dubbed the Great Speech, that he wanted all the Christian elements not involved in violent crimes and or treason back in Anatolia, Barton said the Turks would get help from Bolsheviks to achieve their goal. The only way to save the Christians was for the U.S. to take mandate over Anatolia, Russian Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan. Other members of the missionary establishment quickly followed suit, joining the chorus publicly declaring that atrocities could reignite if the U.S. didn't fulfill its duty to the Armenians. Source, James L. Barton, Turks Still at War, Civilization Threatened, Decatur Review, December 8, 1920, page 8. Ambassador Morgenthau was also firmly behind this scheme, 
advocating separate mandates over Istanbul, Armenian, and the rest of Anatolia. With total lack of foresight, he declared Turkey finished and said that Turkey would represent no problems for an occupier. Source, cut Turkey up, plan of Morgenthau, San Antonio Evening News, December 12, 1918. And also, R.V. Ulehan urges three mandates to govern Turkey. New York Times, May 30th, 1919, page 2. How wrong can one get? As well, we know, Turkey fought courageously with limited resources and manpower, all the major powers and occupiers of the time, directly or through proxies, for four years to achieve her independence at great cost of lives. William Walker Rockwell, another mastermind behind the anti-Turkish campaign, wrote that Armenians were the largest population group in Armenia and that the Turkish government is paying Kurds and Tatars of Persia and Caucasus to move to Armenia to change the demographics and build a Muslim majority. All of this was absurd. No such appropriation existed. In any case, neither the Ottoman government nor the Turkish nationalists had the money or the inclination. Source, Justin McCarthy, Muslims and Minorities. New York University Press, 1983, page 112. Another, uh, of course, other writers assured the unsuspecting Americans that all the people of Anatolia, including Turks, wanted an American mandate, whereas the fact is that some did, but most did not. Hence, the Turks passionately fought an all-or-nothing independence war. The press was replete with, in, with misinformation. Prevailing opinion for American intervention in Armenia was based on wholly fictitious evidence that Armenia had massive oil and coal deposits ripe for development and that the huge Armenian army had defeated the Turks and so on. Of course, none of them was true. They did not make sense either. After all, if they were true, then why would Armenia, so rich in resources and military power, need America's help? Henry Wells of Chicago Tribune, reporting from Paris, stressed that the U.S. could prevent a holy war and slaughter of more Armenians if the U.S. declared a mandate over Armenia. Source, U.S. mandate is chief hope of Armenians. San Antonio Evening News, July 31st, 1919, page 2. The New York Times and Christian Science Monitor were particularly dedicated to promoting the Armenian cause. The Monitor ran numerous articles quoting embellished stories from missionaries and Armenian leaders, but no Turkish responses or rebuttals were solicited or allowed. They were all calling for U.S. mandate and warning that massacres of Armenians would restart if the mandate was not accepted. Source, extermination, it is officially said, faces Armenians. Christian Science Monitor, October 1st, 1919, page 1. J. Herbert Knapp, a missionary working for the Near East Relief, suggested in a long article in the Monitor that the Turks would accept a new order in which Ottoman Europe and Istanbul were given to the Greeks and separate lands of their own were carved out of the Turkish soil for Armenians and Kurds. Whatever territory was left for the Turk was good enough for them, and even the old capitulations would continue there. Source, recognition of united Turkey is urged as solution in the Orient. Christian Science Monitor, August 12, 1922, page 7. In a full-page New York Times article, James W. Gerard, head of the American Committee for the Independence of Armenia, stressed that the Armenians were brother Christians and warned that war could break out if America did not take the mandate and that there would be perfect peace if America took the mandate. Not making the mandate would mean the loss of a great opportunity for the propagation of the Anglo-Saxon civilization in the Near East. America's military obligation would be limited to, quote, only a few thousand Marines, unquote. 
because the Armenians would have a large army themselves. These were totally absurd statements, of course, if not also defamatory and deceptive. Source, want, wants all Turkey under a mandate. New York Times, June 4th, 1919, page 23. See also The Sword of Islam. New York Times, August 31st, 1919, page 33. Missionaries such as Ernest Yarrow reported unspecified massacres of Armenians to the, to the American press. He added that the Amer Armenians would be crucified unless America came there in force. Near East representatives alleged atrocities against Armenians all over Eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus, conveniently omitting, of course, the Armenian atrocities victimizing Muslims, mostly Turks. Source, Turk atrocities are reported. Oakland Tribune, April 22, 1920, page 20. At the Paris Peace Conference, allies wanted President Wilson to determine the borders of Armenia and preferably assume a mandate over it. Under the circumstances, two American investigation commissions were sent out to examine conditions in the Near East. The first one was King Crane Commission dispatched to Arab lands, which I will cover today in this episode 47. First printed as the King Crane Report on the Near East in editor and publisher, New York, volume 55. Number 27 in 1922. Second one was General Harvard mission sent to Eastern Anatolia and the Caucasus, which I will cover next week in episode 48. Both of these commissions submitted reports advocating an American mandate and were heavily motivated by the missionaries' input. Source, Justin McCarthy, Turks in America, page 273. Let's start with the King Crane Commission. The leaders of the King Crane Commission were Henry Churchill King and Charles Richard Crane. Both were already committed to Armenian cause. The two biased gentlemen interviewed many missionaries for their report and relied upon even the propaganda of Lord Bryce as evidence of Armenian massacres. They concluded that it would be impossible to suggest an Armenia extending from the Black Sea to the Mediterranean Sea, but suggested carving out lands from Turkey and a bit from Russia to enlarge current Armenia under the protection of a powerful mandatory state, preferably the United States. To understand the background, one needs to be reminded of the secret treaties by the Allies to partition the Ottoman Empire. One can then appreciate why it was necessary for nations such as Britain, France, and Russia to demonize the Turks regarding the alleged Armenian genocide. Most of these treaties, drawn up by the British and the French, concerned Turkey, the richest war loot for the victors. One was between Russia, France, and Britain in March 1915, when Istanbul was promised to Tsarist Russia. Another was the Treaty of London, signed in April 1915, giving Italy amazing stretches of territory in Europe and Africa and Anatolia. In a follow-up secret treaty in April 1917, Italy was promised a still larger zone in Anatolia, this time including Izmir. But the squabble in Paris ended in the Greek invasion of Izmir on May 15, 1919, to circumvent the Italians. It was this arrogance and the Greek atrocities in Western Anatolia that fanned the flames of Turkish nationalist movement, which has become victorious over the Christian powers by September 9, 1922. And in March 1916, the secret treaty between Russia and France gave Russia the land lying between Persia and the Black Sea. It extended France's pros prospective territory in Turkey. Two months later, in May 1916, came the most infamous of them all, the Sykes-Picot Agreement between France and Great Britain. By this accord, France was to have Syria, Great Britain, Mesopotamia. 
the cities of Damascus, Homs, and Aleppo were to go to some future Arab state, and already King Hussein of the Hejaz was on Great Britain's payroll. From day, from day with signing until now, this agreement has been smeared with oil and other forms of imperialistic explo exploitation. If there had been no such secret treaties, there would probably be no Eastern crisis today. One of the bleakest sessions of the delegates at Paris was held in Lloyd George's apartment on March 20th, 1919. It was during this acrimonious debate that there was born President Wilson's suggestion of sending a commission of inquiry to Turkey. Before delving into the King Crane report, let us now briefly examine the reporters. Dr. Henry Churchill King, the president of Oberlin College in Ohio, was appointed in 1919 to serve on the American section of Paris Peace Conference Inter-Allied Commission on Mandates in Turkey. King was a minister of the Congregational Church, the religious group that was foundation of uh, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, and an official of the Federal Council of Churches with ties to the Near East Relief and to the missionary establishment. Charles R. Crane, an industrialist who made his fortune in plumbing fixtures, a trustee of Robert College and president of the board of the Constantinople Women's College, both Protestant missionary establishments in Istanbul, had served as treasurer of the American Commission for Armenian and Syrian Relief. He was both a board member of the Near East Relief and a member of the American section of the Paris Peace Conference Inter-Allied Commission on Mandates in Turkey in 1919. Perceived expert on Anatolia, uh, the King Crane Commission uh, was the Presbyterian minister, Dr. George Montgomery. He had been a Congregationalist pastor and a professor of philosophy with no expertise in the Middle East, other than being born of missionary parents in Ottoman Anatolia. He had served in Istanbul in 1916 as an assistant to Henry Morgenthau, the U.S. ambassador to the Ottoman Empire. Montgomery's writings indicate a deep prejudice against Muslims in general and Turks in particular. In the report he, re he prepared before the commission set out, he wrote that Islam was completely selfish religion and could not be reformed and that Muslims could always be expected to fight against Christians. Source, Harry N. Howard, the King Crane Commission, an American inquiry in the Middle East, published in Beirut, Kayats, published in 1963, page 196. The commission prepared itself before departure by reading the recommended works, all of which were anti-Turkish biased, such as the reports of Near East Relief, British Propaganda's Blue Book the, and the Frontiers of Language and Nationality in Europe by Leon Dominion. It would be difficult to imagine a more one-sided version of history than the one available in this body of recommended reading. Thus, even before the Commission began its investigation, the conclusions of its report on the Armenians were clear due to the mindset of the members. King had given a report to the President Wilson in Paris before leaving for the East, suggesting that an independent Armenia should be created and that Turks would continue to kill our uh, unions uh, other, uh, unless this occurred. Montgomery even advised that the commission should not go at all because they already knew everything that was, need, that, that, that was needed uh, to come to conclusion and make recommendations. Source, Howard, the King Crane Commission, pages 7980. It is astonishing that the members of the commission felt themselves competent to speak on the Armenian issue at all because they made so little effort to go to the scene of the Turkish-Armenian conflict. The Commission's travels were primarily in the Arab provinces, 
of the Ottoman Empire. The report stated that members had discovered all they needed to know about the conditions in Anatolia by studying relevant materials and holding meetings in Paris and Istanbul. They had briefly visited only one area, Cilicia, the land near Adana today. Yet, they considered themselves knowledgeable enough to declare explicitly that Turks had massacred Armenians throughout Anatolia without mentioning the Armenian massacres of Turks. The report alleged that the massacres had been centrally organized by the Ottoman government. I quote, Massacres of Armenians have been due to deliberate and direct government actions in which the Turkish people themselves have been too willing to share. They have not been crimes of passion of the moment, and they have involved cruelties horrible and beyond description." Unquote. Source, U.S. Department of State, papers relating to foreign relations of the United States, the Paris Peace Conference, 1919, the King Crane Report, Volume 12, page 811. After numerous anti-Turkish and pro-Armenian statements, King Crane proposed an Armenian state, but they said it could not be truly independent and should be placed under the guardianship of a Western state, preferably the United States. This is exactly what the American missionaries advocated all along. Is anyone surprised? As a justification for their suggestions, King Crane relied not on their own field observations, but on the reading materials from missionary and Armenian sources that they had been given before the trip. They proposed separate mandates for Istanbul and what remained for the Turks in Anatolia. And the three mandates would be somehow unified under a U.S. umbrella. Source, how to Americans uh, uh, planned to settle Near East problems. New York Times, December 4th, 1922, page 12. The King Crane Report had a significant influence on the discussions of the American government, but its effect on the American public came primarily through the newspaper articles. King Crane told newspapers that they had recommended an American mandate for at least Armenia and that all the people of the Ottoman Empire wanted America to be in charge. They continued to disseminate the cliches about Turkish-Armenian conflict. The U.S. government withheld their report, perhaps because of suggesting independence in the Arab Middle East, which would clash with the imperialistic demands of America's British and French allies. The report was finally revealed in 1922 when the New York Times obtained a copy from the former President Wilson. In summary, King Crane Commission visited 36 cities, mostly in Arab provinces of the Ottoman Empire, in the six-week period from June 10 to July 21, 1919. Bias, arrogance, disrespect, deception, defamation, and racism ubiquitous in the U.S. Protestant missionary reports from Anatolia before, during, and after the World War I, and by extension in the U.S. and European media coverage based on such reports, have found their way into the King Crane report. Prejudice and perception trumped objectivity and facts. The U.S. government withheld the report because, the, because of the suggestion of independence for Arab states in it would clearly clash with the imperialistic demands of, the Brit of Britain and France. Thus, King Crane report had little effect on American public or in international arena. The General Harbor Commission, on the other hand, was to have a greater impact, and we will study that next in episode 48. Thank you for joining me, and see you next week.